Now, starring George Raft, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. I once heard an Arab wise man say, the price of wisdom is above gold. Well, sometimes you can know too much. Then the price is lead out of a 38. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, chiefs, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's transcribed Rocky Jordan story, Man in the Nile. Hi, I'm Chris. I fix the drinks here at the tambourine. Yeah, and speaking of drinks, I remember the time the Rock himself took a hand in mixing the biggest martini you ever saw. And brother, when I say big, I mean big. I remember the night it happened. It was one of those dark, moonless nights. A low haze clinging to the river. And in the middle of it all, chugging along cautiously, a small boat... How much longer before we get back to Cairo, Hassan? A uh, half hour, possibly. I do not dare go faster, Jordan Bay. The, the poor visibility. Yeah, we better be careful. This load of gin and vermouth we have on board sent me back five grand. I... Listen. This I had feared. A speedboat, Jordan Bay. I tremble when they are on the river. I had better warn him. Here, I'll do that. You stay with the wheel. Sounds like he's over that way. I will turn for sure. Look out, Hassan. There he is. Aye. Coming right at us. Jump, Hassan. Jump. The next second, Rocky and Hassan were flapping around on the Nile, up to here in Jin and Vermouth. And just about the same time, something else happened about 30 miles up the river. The body of a dead man hit the black waters of the Nile, sunk a few feet, then bobbed to the surface and started floating with the current, face down. Don't, don't help me! Help me! Help me! Okay, Hassan. Take it easy. You all right? Yes, yes, yes. Hey! Hey, you in the boat! How do you like that? The dirty rat's pulling away. He's not even going to pick us up. Well, Hassan's boat had gone down with Rock's load of liquor. And there wasn't anything to do but start swimming for sure. And Rocky did just that with Hassan in tow. An hour later, Rocky filled in the Cairo port authorities about what had happened. And then he headed back to the cafe. And the next day, Rocky had a phone call from a guy who ran a boat shop, and it sent him down to the docks. I think this is the boat you are interested in finding. Yeah. This looks like the one that rammed us. Who brought it in? A most beautiful young lady. She told me to make all necessary repairs and uh, gave me 100 pounds in advance. 50 to fix the boat and 50 to keep your mouth shut. Exactly. And for another 10, you'll open it. Here. Her name is Karen Andresen. She resides at the Victoria apartment. The Rock put in a call to the police and started for the Victoria apartments. Meanwhile, up the river, the man in the Nile floated downstream. He was a big man with cropped hair. His passport said Ed Fredericks, American. Occupation, newspaper correspondent. The bullet hole was in his chest. When the door of suite 506 of the Victoria Apartments finally opened, there she was, blonde, blue-eyed, and beautiful. 
Yes. What is it? The name's Jordan, Miss Andresen. Rocky Jordan. Oh. Oh, well, we've got business to talk over. I just found your speedboat. My my boat? The one you were using last night on the river when you rammed into me. What are you talking about, Mr. Jordan? What is it, my dear? Oh. Ah, we have a visitor, Karen. How do you do? Uncle Nils, this is Mr. Jordan. Nils Hegstrom, sir. How do you do? Jordan. Oh, yes, yes, the morning newspapers. There was an accident on the river last night. A boat was sunk. With 5,000 bucks worth of my liquor aboard. That's why I'm here. But, uh, but why, Mr. Jordan? He is accusing me of sinking his boat. I wasn't even on the river last night. You know I wasn't, Uncle Nils, don't you? Don't you? Uh, Mr. Jordan... According to the papers, your accident occurred shortly before 10. Is that correct? That's right. Just a few miles from Cairo. Uh, Karen, uh, what time was it when you picked me up on the other side of the river last night? A few minutes after 10, was it not? Yes. Ah, I thought there was something wrong at the time. You acted strange, nervous, upset. Apparently, there was good reason for this unusual behavior, was there not, Karen? All right, all right. I did it, yes. Karen, why did you not tell me? Oh, I don't know, Uncle Nils. I... I'm sorry, Mr. Jordan. What else can one say? It was a very stupid, thoughtless thing I did running away, but can you understand that I was frightened? So frightened? Uh, naturally, Mr. Jordan, you and the boat owner will be reimbursed for your loss. We will settle the matter quietly. I'm afraid it's not going to be as easy as all that. You see, uh, I've already called the police told them about Miss Andresen's boat. Well, the cops took over, and that was that. Karen was booked, then released in the custody of Nils Hegstrom. And 20 miles or so up the river, the body of Ed Fredericks, the man in the Nile, picked up speed as it floated along in the blackness. Ed Fredericks, the name was well known. It had bylined a lot of big stories out of the capitals of the world. But now he was nothing but a corpse, floating by a raft full of natives, unnoticed in the night. And meanwhile, Rocky sat alone in his office at the tambourine. And it was easy to see that he wasn't happy about the way things had turned out with Karen Andresen. About nine o'clock, Rocky got a phone call from a guy who wouldn't leave his name, but who had something interesting to say. Mr. Jordan, I have just found the boat. The one that... Ran you down. You're a little late, aren't you? I found it this afternoon. Oh, that boat? Miss Andresen's, you mean? <laughs> no, Mr. Jordan. The boat that was involved in the accident was not Miss Andresen. What? Furthermore, Miss Andresen herself was not involved. Wait a minute. She admitted it. So I have heard, yes. But you see, I am certain she had nothing to do with the accident. Then uh, why did she confess? An interesting question, Mr. Jordan. The answer should be equally interesting. Hello? Hello? Rocky sat there for a while, staring at the telephone. Then he got up and walked out. A quarter of an hour later, he was buzzing Karen Andresen's apartment. And just at about that time, at a spot some ten miles from Cairo, the man in the Nile, good and dead, got himself tangled in a patch of reeds along the bank and stayed there, bobbing gently up and down. Yes, what? Oh, Mr. Jordan. May I come in, Miss Andresen? Why not? What have I done now? Maybe it's what you haven't done. What do you mean? Well, I got a phone call a little while ago from a man who said uh, you had nothing to do with the accident on the river last night. Really? Your caller was a crank, Mr. Jordan. What were you doing on the river? We've been all through that. I was to pick up Uncle Nils. But you were moving downriver when you hit us. Oh, well, well I, I don't remember, really. Perhaps you're right. Yes, yes, I was going downriver. Uh, sorry, the speedboat that hit us wasn't going upriver or downriver. It was cutting directly across the river, coming at us from the south bank. Not really, Mr. Jordan, I told you, I don't remember how it happened. Now, please, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I, I'm so ashamed of myself. Why should you be ashamed for something you didn't do? Oh, no. 
Oh, it's all over, Mr. Jordan. Finished. Can't we let it go at that? No, we can't. Why should you take the rat? Please. Okay. If that's the way you want it. Now, why don't you ask me out for a drink? I think I should like that. Well, that's the way it all started between Rocky and Karen over a couple of scotch and sodas at a quiet little bar with soft lights and music. By the time the rock left Karen that night, it was pretty clear that they were more than a little interested in each other. They picked up again the next day, a late breakfast on the sun-drenched terrace of the Villa Montoya overlooking the Nile. Then they went out to Gazera, the racetrack. <laughs> oh, Rocky, what happened to our long shot? Well, you can't win them all, Karen. We haven't won a race yet. That's your fault. How can you expect a guy to concentrate on picking the right pony when you're around? <laughs> Looking so beautiful. Old Cairo. It's fascinating, Rocky. I've never been here before. We've only started, Karen. There are a lot of things to see. A lot more things to do. Oh, not getting tired, are you? Of course not. I'm having a wonderful time. <laughs> You know, Karen, I've been on this road a hundred times, watched the sunset over the desert, but somehow it never looked the way it does now. Yes, it's beautiful, isn't it? Funny how a guy starts noticing things all of a sudden. You know what I mean? Yes, Rocky, I know what you mean. Well, just about the time that Rocky and Karen got back to Cairo... Ten miles away, a kid was poking along the river's edge. And he spotted something in a patch of reeds. He moved closer. And that's when he spotted the body in the water. The kid whirled around, took off on the double to find a phone... and start the police off on a murder investigation. Around two that morning, Rocky and Karen wound up at the door of her apartment... I've had a wonderful, wonderful evening, Rocky. Too bad it has to end so soon. It's very late. Sure. But I don't have anyone waiting up for me. Neither do I, Rocky. Oh, darling. Rocky stepped out of the Victoria Apartments and started down the street. A car pulled up at the curb alongside him. Oh, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Yeah, what's on your mind? We have never met, Mr. Jordan. My name is Anton Mitescu. I think we have met. Only it was over the telephone, right? Correct. And you've been trailing me all day. A charming couple, you and Miss Andresen. Yes, she's the most beautiful woman. Most beautiful but also, I think, a murderess. What? For further details, Mr. Jordan, I suggest you consult your local newspaper. <laughs> Good night. Well, whether it's true or not, it's kind of a jolt to be told the dame you've fallen for is a killer. The Rock headed back to the tambourine. On the way, he bought a paper, and that's when he read all about the killing of Ed Fredericks, the famous international correspondent, the guy who'd been floating in the Nile. The next day, Rocky and Karen picked up where they'd left off. He took her to lunch at the Mina House Hotel at the foot of the pyramid. Rocky, you've been so quiet. Something is on your mind. Oh, I've just been going over that murder story that's in the papers. Ed Fredericks, the correspondent. Oh, you knew him? No, I didn't really know him, but I did bump into him once or twice in Istanbul. I had a cafe there. Oh, I see. But that's not it. Well, there's a little brain cell way back here trying to buzz me a message. It's about your last name. It sounds real familiar to me, and I, I just can't seem to pin it down. I'm sorry, Rocky. I can't help. I don't know where we... Well, it'll come to me. Well, tell me something, Karen. Do you know a fellow named Anton Matesco? Matesco? 
Mm, tall, thin, pencil mustache, and patent leather hair. Oh, him. You do know him, then? No, but I've seen him a few times at my hotel looking at me quite intently. I did not like it. That's all you know about him? Yes. Why? Oh, nothing. Forget it. Rocky, are you sure everything is all right between us? Yeah. So far, everything's fine. After Rock took Karen back to a hotel that afternoon, he wandered into the offices of the Cairo Times and looked up an Egyptian encyclopedia named Joseph Yemu. Andresen. Andresen, eh? That name concerns you, Rocky, eh? eh? Perhaps it was the headlines in last night's papers that brought it to mind. Maybe. Is there a tie-in with Ed Frederick's murder? There is a tie-in with Ed Frederick's. Well, how does it go? Well, three years ago, Mr. Ed Fredericks, working for a certain New York newspaper, wrote, wrote a series, a series of... of stories exposing a certain gentleman named Alec Andresen. Sure, I remember it now. A swindle. Andresen was a bigwig on the International Cotton Exchange. Correct. Fredericks' expose ruined Andresen completely. He resigned from the exchange and later was indicted for fraud. A few weeks later, Andresen committed suicide. They found his car at the ocean's edge. He was never seen again. Thanks. You are leaving? Yeah, I've got a date with a man who makes nasty statements. Hello, Matesco. Ah, Mr. Jordan. You have sought me out. It wasn't hard. You left a pretty good trail. But of course. I wanted you to be able to find me with little difficulty when you found the need. Uh, Come in, come in. What have you got on Karen Adresen? Yes, that is important indeed. You two have grown quite fond of each other. Oh, yes, I have made it my business to notice. All right. I'll make it your business to talk. You know, of course, about Karen's father, Alec Andresen and Ed Fredericks. Yeah, I know. So now you're going to tell me Karen killed Fredericks to avenge her father. Is that not ample motive? Yeah, it has been. But you'll have to do better than that. Fredericks was killed upriver about 30 miles or so. And Karen Andresen was in Cairo at the same time, running you down in a speedboat on the Nile? Except, Jordan, the fact is she was not the one who ran you down in the speedboat, regardless of what the Egyptian court will say. How do you know so much? Simply because it was I who ran you down in the boat. Not intentionally, of course. Now, Jordan, why would Miss Karen Andresen admit to something she did not do? Obviously because she was establishing an alibi. For if an Egyptian court found her guilty of the action against you, she could not very easily be accused of killing Mr. Ed Fredericks 30 miles away. You worked it out pretty neatly. Truth is not always elusive. (laughs) Now, would you not say that the knowledge I hold will make me a wealthy man? Hmm? All right, Rock. What Mitesco said about the boat is true. I did not run you down on the Nile. The front of my boat was smashed deliberately after the story of your accident appeared in the newspapers. Yeah, everything was set up, just like Mitesco said. You were establishing an alibi. Yes. For the killing of Ed Frederick. No. No? Then why did you need an alibi? Karen, you better level it out. Yes. Perhaps I better. I'll tell you all that happened, but you must believe me. I met Ed Fredericks a few weeks ago in Alexandria. I'd never seen him before. He said his name was Grant, that he was an importer. I saw no reason to doubt him. All right, go on. Well... We became quite friendly. Not like you and me, Rocky. Still, we saw much of each other and... Well, you know how things like that are. We talked and I told him a lot about myself and... And he was a good listener, I'll bet. Last week, I found out who he really was. Now, understand, Rocky, I am not defending my father. What he did at the cotton exchange was wrong, but... Could I be expected to turn against a man who had been so kind and loving to me for as long as I could remember? Well, that figures. Keep it going. So, there was Ed Fredericks taking me out, dining with me, dancing with me, lying to me, 
using me to get information, kissing me. Well, how would you feel? Just as I did, I think. Angry and ashamed. That's when I did a foolish thing. I bought a gun. What was that for? To prevent Fredericks from reopening the whole business about my father. Even if you had to kill him? That must have been what was in my mind. On the way to Fredericks' house in Riga, I became frightened at what my anger would drive me to do. I threw the gun in the river and went on to Fredericks' house without it to plead with him to forget this long-forgotten happening. When I got there, I found him dead. I'm still with you. I became terrified. I had bought a gun. I had a motive. I feared I'd been seen going into his house. I came back to Cairo, told Uncle Nils what had happened, and he helped me set up the alibi after reading about your mishap in the newspapers. Yeah. Take the rap on a light charge to clear yourself of a serious one. Yes, Rocky. Well, that is it. You believe me, don't you? Rocky, I knew you would. But there's still the matter of Frederick's killer. Yes. Karen, are you sure there's not something else you want to tell me? No, Rocky. I told you everything. <sighs> okay. I think you ought to go down to police headquarters and tell Captain Sabaya just what you told me. But, Rocky, what... what afraid I... to? No, I'm not afraid. Come on. I'll take you down. Well, while Karen was in talking to Sam, Rocky sat outside the office thinking. And suddenly a thought hit him. And a few minutes later, he stood in front of Suite 506 at the Victoria Apartments. And just as he was about to lean on the doorbell, the door came open and Nils Hegstrom, a trench coat draped over his arm, stepped out. Well, Mr. Jordan, I was just coming in to see you. I received a phone call a moment ago from Captain Sabaya of the Cairo Police. He wishes to talk to me at headquarters about the... I know what it's about. Karen and the Fredericks murder. I'll come along. Uh, my car is in the hotel garage. The elevator will take us there. You first, Hegstrom. Uh, the basement, uh, Jordan. The garage is located there. Oh, tell me something, uh, Hegstrom. What was Fredericks working on before he was killed? I wouldn't know, Jordan. Why do you ask me? Well, Fredericks wouldn't be working on a story three years old. He either had a new angle or a new yarn. My guess, he was working on a story about you. About me? That's right. Mr. Jordan, it appears to me your tone has suddenly turned unfriendly. Maybe it's because I just figured something out. It seems as though you were setting up an alibi for Karen. What you really were doing was setting up an alibi for yourself. If you were in Cairo across the Nile, when Karen picked you up in that boat, you couldn't very well be accused of killing Fredericks 30 miles away. No, no, I could not. Well, when we get to headquarters, you better be ready to answer a very important question. Where were you when Fredericks was killed? A question it would be difficult for me to answer. I'm not surprised. Uh, take your eyes, Jordan. You first this time. I'd rather follow you. Jordan, this is a gun in my coat pocket. Now, into the garage, please. Okay. What happens now? My car is over there, Jordan. That's a den. Move, please. Well, you're still polite. Oh, tell me something, Hegstrom. Exactly what happened at Frederick's house? I went to see him to buy the article he was writing. Only he wouldn't sell. One thing led to another, and he ended up with a little heartburn. From a bullet. Yes. Karen came into the house soon after that. I hid in the next room. After she left, I deposited the body in the Nile, hoping it would not be discovered too quickly. Okay. Now, everything makes a neat bundle. But what about Karen? I thought you cared for her. And Sabaya may be booking her right now for that murder. I care a great deal for her, Jordan. More than you realize. After you are found dead and I have vanished, everything will become quite clear to the police. She will be released. She has no idea I killed Fredericks. None at all. Now... Into the car, Jordan. Move, quickly. Yeah, real quickly. Jordan! The rock stepped out like a sprinter and ducked behind a cement column before Hegstrom could get his gun out. Jordan! But Rocky didn't wait. He took out across the garage using the parked cars for protection, figuring to make a fast exit out the door of the ramp. Only the door was locked up tighter than a bank brawl on the holiday. Jordan! This is wasted effort! 
you cannot get away. Rocky dropped behind some gasoline drums, and Hegstrom edged along the wall, his 38 looking for a good, clear shot. And that's when the idea hit the rock, and he went to work fast. He opened the spigot of one of the drums, spilled some gasoline down the ramp, and then gave the drum a shove. It moved right for Hegstrom, who saw it coming, and sidestepped. The drum cracked into the wall behind him. Licked the gurgle out of it, making a pool of gasoline on the garage floor. Jordan, you missed! Did I? Your feet are wet. What difference does that make? This. A match, Hegstrom. Get the idea? Jordan! I drop the match here and the flame will get to you before you can move. No, Jordan! Then give it up, Hegstrom. Throw your gun out. Throw it out before you get barbecued. Yes, Jordan. Yes, I will throw it out. Look. Yeah, I'm watching. Go ahead. Hegstrom's bullet ricocheted off the ramp. There was a spark, and the next thing you know, Hegstrom was standing in the center of the flame. But only for a second. Then he staggered out and collapsed in Rocky's arms. Well, Rocky got to a phone, and a little later, Hegstrom was hauled off to the police hospital. And a half hour or so after that, Captain Sabaya had all the facts. Uh, all, that is, except one. That one didn't come out until Rocky and Karen had a little private talk in one of the small rooms at the police station. Well, you'd be free in an hour or so, Karen. I want you to know I'm sorry it turned out to be Hegstrom. I know how you feel about him. I do not blame you, Rocky. None of it was your fault. Your life was in danger and... Rocky? Yes, Karen? There's something I must tell you. What is it? Nils Hegstrom is not my uncle. He is... Alec Andresen. He's my father. I figured it might be that way. Your father's body was never found. He was hiding out under a different name. Fredericks found out. That's the story Fredericks was going to write, wasn't it? Yes, Rocky. That makes it kind of rough between you and me, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. Well, you know how I feel about you. Nothing has changed that, but still... Being with you would always remind me of the most tragic thing in my life. It would remind me always of something I should forget. I'm sorry, Karen. Another way, it might have been pretty good. Yes, another way. Goodbye, Rocky. I don't think we shall ever see each other again. Goodbye, Karen. Good luck. Oh, Rocky? Yeah? One small kiss before you go? Our star, Mr. George Raft, returns in just a moment. The Nation's Nightmare, special six-week CBS radio probe, looks into crime on the waterfront. Then there's a sprightly musical session in Robert Q's Waxworks in store. The FBI in Peace and War tackles first offense criminals who lure teenagers into organized crime. Broadway Playhouse stars Francho Tone and Wendy Berry in the campus comedy Ball of Fire. When? Why, each and every one of the CBS radio treats will come right this way over most of these same stations tomorrow night. Now, here again is the star of our show, Mr. George Raft. Well... Karen left Cairo by the midnight plane. And that was the last I saw of her. I don't think about her too much anymore. Only whenever I look at the blue waters of the Nile. Hope to see you at the Cafe Tambourine again next week. Until then, Saida. <laughs> Rocky Jordan stars Mr. George Raff with Anthony Barrett as Chris. Also heard in tonight's cast were Jay Novello, Byron Kane, Gladys Holland, Ted Von Elts, and Donald Morrison. Our original music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Production and direction by Cliff Howell. Rocky Jordan is written by Larry Roman and Adrian Jondo. Joe Walters speaking. This transcribed program came to you over the CBS radio network. <laughs>